Whoop, there we go. And then welcome to Nifty's 11th webinar. Looking uh, for incubator farms and farmers. Uh, my name is Sam Anderson. I'm the interim, or I, I should say, outgoing interim National Incubator Farm Training Initiative Coordinator at, at New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Um, in fact, after this webinar, I'll be phasing out of the role and handing things off to the new Nifty Coordinator, Brianna Bauman. Uh, Great New Entry is the organization bringing you this webinar. We operation as a farm incubator, among other things, since 1998. Our day is record keeping, including both the kinds of records you may want to keep as a farm incubator project and kinds of record keeping that your farmers would do, whether financial records or production records. Uh, we'll talk about different record keeping systems how to make good use of your records, and thoughts about maybe the hardest thing of all, of making sure it actually happens. Hopefully after this webinar, you'll have some ideas for improving uh, the way you and your participating farmers deal with record keeping. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the Cedar Tree Foundation and Northeast SARE, for making this event and the uh, and NIFTY program possible, as well as our presenters, uh, Steve Paddock from the Vermont Small Business Development Center, Nikki Siebert from Low Country Local First. So here's our agenda. We'll start with a very quick uh, technology training. Uh, talk for a couple minutes about the uh, National Incubator Farm Training Initiative, and then move on to our presentations. After that, we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, so you'll be able to ask specific questions related to your own individual projects. Now, the presentation slides, some of the spreadsheet tools being presented, or well, the presentation slides at least, uh, and a recording of the webinar will be available on the NIFTY website within 48 hours. Uh, you don't have to worry about writing everything down or reading all the slides as we go. And a link for that recording in a follow-up email after the webinar. So let's on quickly that wraps up the housekeeping. I'm going to talk for just a quick minute or two about uh, NIFTY. I'm familiar with this information, so I'll, I'll try and keep, keep it brief. Even new entry received funding to provide technical uh, assistance and training to start up incubator projects across the country. Uh, you can see here our map of incubator projects that have sprung up in the recent past. We have about 150 projects, either in the beginning stages or in operation on this map, which you can find on our website. Uh, many of these projects have shared challenges, and Entry and various other partners have come together to address the increasing requests for training and TA around these topics. As you know, we offer webinars like the one you're currently Viewing. This is our 11th webinar, and all of our previous webinars are available to view for free on our website and have been viewed over a thousand times now. Uh, we offer a referral service um, for projects to receive free one on one mentoring and technical assistance from uh, project partners uh, shown here. Uh, so, ALBA, the Agriculture and Land Based Training Association, um, us, New Entry, uh, the Vale Center, the Minnesota Food Association the International Rescue Committee, and the New American Sustainable Agriculture Project at Cultivating Community. Uh, it's provided over 180 hours of technical assistance to 60 organizations throughout the U.S. and Canada. Uh, I had three national in-person field schools that have brought together dozens of organizations to share and learn from each other. Our third field school just happened in October, and we had over 70 attendees at the Headwaters Incubator Project uh, just, out of, just outside of Portland, Oregon. As for online resources, we have an excellent and relatively low volume but high quality listserv, which anyone can sign up for on our website. And our online searchable database of over 150 documents, uh, curricula, manuals, forms, uh, case studies, and other things um, are available for free download. And then we also released a comprehensive farm incubator toolkit um, in September of 2013. Uh, and we have case studies and recently a guide to metrics and evaluation for farm incubators. Uh, there's a lot of great information in these, and it definitely includes you to take a look at all of these if you haven't already. And there's the link down in the 
corner. So I'm now going to turn it over to Steve Paddock, if I get this up. Moment, put the screen back. And a reminder um, that you can enter questions into the chat box as Steve presents, and we'll track these and have him address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so that'll do it. Take it away, Steve. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. And I, uh, I'm um, i today from Vermont, snowy, cold Vermont here. We've had a cold spell that uh, probably a lot of the rest of the company is enjoying as well. So it's about minus five here, I think, uh, recently. So I serve as the Agribusiness Program Director for the Vermont Small Business Development Center. We're a, a statewide technical assistance provider, and we work with somewhere over a thousand business clients a year, providing both one-on-one -on -one, uh, advising and training. And a, about percent of our uh, clients are in the ag and world, and then we have a, another number that's also in uh, the larger food system. Uh, um, I've been the um, programmer for our agribusiness uh, for about a dozen years, and we work with uh, many organizations around Vermont, including Intervale Center and NOFA Vermont, as well as UVM Extension and uh, um, the Chair of Vermont uh, Food and Farm Viability Program. A uh, brief background on me and how I ended up here. I grew up uh, on a cattle ranch raising purebred and commercial cattle. And after college, I came back to the ranch and was there for about 10 years. And during that time, uh, my wife and I bought our own little piece of land and we had a large confinement poultry and, and operation. And uh, um, after about 10 years, we decided to go in a in a kind of different direction, and I went back to school and earned an MBA and um, spent time in the hospitality fields and some retail and publishing and uh, did a lot of work consulting and advising small um, businesses, and that was something I really enjoyed doing. And as I've heard, about a dozen years, I've been with the Vermont Small Business Development Center, and that's a... It's a great organization, and I recommend uh, one of the small business development centers around the nation to you. There's one not too far away and can provide a lot of uh, help clients into your work. About uh, Talk about teaching farmers record keeping. My focus was primarily on the financial record keeping and, and um, how it would be used in a business and, and how we go about teaching. Uh, our clients and encouraging them to adopt record keeping systems that work for them. And um, I put together what I thought was kind of a mini mission statement about what it is we're trying to do when we talk about uh, teaching clients on record keeping. It's helpful to have the clarity of uh, knowing what it is you want to accomplish by doing it. So this is what I put together and um, I'll you there for your thoughts and, and comments later during the question time. Um, experience and uh, the work we do with clients, I think there are a couple uh, keys to success um, that are important to uh, effectively teach and supporting record keeping for clients. Um, and we do is always easier if the people working with are motivated to make it happen. And when we work with clients, we always uh, expect that the client is the engine for development and the engine for progress. And so we're there to help them do that. And so what we want them to be is internally motivated uh, to grow and develop their business and all of their business. And it's true just the same for record keeping. Uh, the second part of it, the success, 
is that uh, we ensure that they have access to high quality training and then uh, support after that to enable them to adopt and use the systems that are right for them and then to make those systems work for them by uh, providing information to them. Talk for a couple minutes of just about uh, some of the pathways towards uh, help people become internally motivated to doing things and using good practices, whether it be in the record keeping area or in other areas. Uh, I suspect that when you work with farmers, you do a very similar sort of thing uh, we do, and that start out um, having questions with them about what their goals are and what it is they want to accomplish. and why they're doing what they're doing and, and trying to get them to articulate those goals. Connecting any practice, whether it's animal husbandry or record keeping or whatever they're doing, uh, directly to the goals helps them see uh, and find that motivation within themselves. And so part of that's talking to them about the benefits of uh, having good records. When I was thinking about this, I realized that, you know, getting somebody to adopt a practice or select something is very similar to what we talk about uh, with value added producers when they're talking about marketing and thinking about how to get customers to buy their, their products or services. And our uh, producers and farmers and other business people are often highly focused on the features of the products that they put together and we find that the customers are generally always focused on the benefits of the products. So I think getting a, a client to adopt uh, good record keeping practices is kind of making a sale to them and trying to get them to realize what the potential benefits for them are and adopt those benefits. A lot about uh, I'm saying I'm not. Uh, the system itself and what they have to be doing, but what they're going to get from it. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The second part of that pathway is for them to understand the importance of doing this in a systematic sort of way. And, um, for us in particular, I, I think are attuned to systematic things. For any of our producers that have animals, you know, they have a set of chores that they do at least morning and evening, and it's it's a system, it's a routine, and there's a prescribed way that they do it. And by doing it that way, they know they accomplish uh, whatever activities of animal husbandry and care that they're trying to do. And so rather than just going out and feeding and bedding and cleaning stalls or whatever, when they feel like it, they clearly understand the importance of doing it in a systematic way for the bit of it. And so record keeping is very similar to that. There are a few business activities that um, the owners and managers do um, that they have to actually create the time and the system to do that. And, and record keeping is one of those. You know, when the cows get out or when something's split or uh, customers come knock on your door, they demand your attention and they pull you into engagement. But there are activities like record keeping. It'll just kind of sit over in the corner and it'll be very quiet and it won't bother you um, and get you to come take care of it until there's some problem with it. And again, about uh, um, looking at adopting a practice from the standpoint of marketing, um, we talk to clients about marketing. We can the customers typically select or buy their product or service for one or two reasons, either to relieve a pain, to relieve something that's bothering them or they're suffering from, or to gain some sort of benefit. And I think there's a very good approach to uh, promoting record keeping and, and move them towards the state of internally being motivated uh, by thinking about it from the gain or pain perspective. And I'll bit about that in a second, too. In thinking with clients on their goals, uh, one statements that I've learned over the years from a colleague here uh, that I've found to be incredibly effective is that uh, to, to draw people in part of that goal conversation to a statement like this first one here, that within three years or two years or four years, whatever right for them, we want our farm to provide 
number a year for fam living. This is an incredibly powerful statement that um, makes them think in realistic terms about what their needs are and then provides a check as they go uh, deeper into their planning about getting a plan that uh, can meet a criteria like this. If, we, if, we're, if this is a, the type of goal that we're talking about with a client, we heal to them on a variety of different levels and areas about why records and record keeping are important to them. And the questions down below here are certainly some of just a few of the things that they want to know about their operation in order to achieve profitability. Um, it's also always helpful for them to know how to compare with other firms and sometimes that creates a motivation to do better and to do as well as some other farm. In New England, there's a, uh, a Northeast Dairy Farm summary that comes out every year. It shows dairy farmers exactly what a large group of other farms are doing in a various uh, of production and income um, for the individual farmer um, know where they stand in relationship to others. And it's commonly done in the Midwest in grain farms where farmers record pooled and then uh, the averages are shared back with them so they understand other growers are able to do. So questions about um, how they can improve their farm and uh, activities that they might want to start doing or stop doing either because the potential for profit or stop doing it if they're not making any margin on them. There are all sorts of questions that records can provide information for and help uh, an individual farm move closer to their goal of within three years being able to provide that number that they are seeking for family living. Some of the benefits of good records uh, um, are around tax compliance. And, uh, um, tax compliance has the uh, kind of nice benefit of being able to both avoid pain and seek gain. I've worked with any farmers who have uh, fallen behind in their taxes and um, particularly um, farms that have any hired employees and if they have failed to file their payroll taxes and then submit their payments in a timely fashion, they've just opened the door to a world of pain and penalties and interests that accrue to that. Um, so by having good records, they're able to uh, meet their tax compliance requirements in a way that's efficient and effective. Uh, save money by having good records when they get ready to go to their tax preparer rather than paying the tax preparer to do the booking that the farm should have been doing all during the year. Uh, they can avoid that, that uh, pain of that expense. And because of the way that farms are taxed, uh, they have an ability to do some simple tax planning towards the end of the year to shift tax burden from one year to another. In order to take advantage of that, they have to understand uh, where they are with their farm profit. They get close to the end of the year. The benefit to them is in the whole area of management and information around these areas uh, to understand and enterprises are working for them and creating margins that, that um, help their expenses and overheads and produce profit for them uh, to avoid waste and uh, manage the other factors that uh, they have to. The last little piece that um, is of interest to producers is the ability to share their information with other people and including lenders, partners, spouses, and sometimes employees as well. And so to have records in good shape and to be able to communicate to others what's going on on your farm is very helpful. You know if you've worked with lenders that they really want to see the numbers and they want to know that the farmer is taking care of those numbers and using them for management information. It's incredibly helpful with partners and spouses when they're trying to make joint decisions and one partner spouse may be more or less kind of uh, financially tuned. And so to have numbers in a way that they can discuss them together is helpful to include everybody on the decision making.
taking the the headlines, if you will, or the top points on um, helping people um, understand and uh, develop that internal motivation to the bits that they get from records. Uh, I want to talk just a minute with you about um, setting up the idea of the right record keeping system for somebody and, and going about doing that. Um, I think it's helpful in, in training, whether it's one on one or in group training, to actually show people what a system looks like, to show them how it works and uh, the flow of um, information, whether it's the financial information or whether they're keeping records on yields and um, per items or if it should be an organically certified farmer, you know, all of the data that they have to keep recorded um, to sh help work them and show them um, what system that's working looks like. So that, that it's really important that um, the record keeping system, whether it's the financial or other sorts of records, is really well integrated into the operation of what's going on, and, and that makes it much easier for a producer to maintain it and understand it. And that's really uh, adapting a system to the needs of the individual farmer. There, there's absolutely not a one-size-fits-all for record-keeping systems. There's a, a, a broad variety of different types of systems and ways to go about it. Um, and so, your own knowledge or with some help from um, other people who are well versed in that, uh, you can pretty easily up a system in conjunction with a producer you're working with. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the learning methods and first talk about uh, from a group perspective. Um, uh, if your organization hasn't uh, provided it to you already, uh, it's really helpful to find some little work or some uh, assistance for you on understanding the needs of adult learners. And um, sometimes adult ed programs at technical centers or uh, other organizations really will do this, and a lot of times they're happy to come speak to your organization or group. But if you, this, you know that adult learners have very different needs than um, the type of learning environment that exists in schools, and one of those involves different types of learning methods like these that are listed below, and um, often we try to plan groups where it's a one-to-many situation where we use several of these modalities to give people different ways to absorb the information. You have to, with this type of thing, you have to move at the speed um, that your learner can take it. Because if you if you try to go too fast and jump over things, or or don't check to ensure that um, the people you're dealing with are absorbing, then you end up with gaps there, and the gaps are are critical to um, bad outcomes. And and that's uh, that's what you'll see if they don't understand a complete system. So one way frequently we'll do that will be to try to use peer groups, and, and you, you can do that by um, different age, by type of farm. Sometimes for a rural area like ours, it, it has to be geographical. Um, sometimes it's simply two people in some sort of a bus system where they support each other in doing it. Uh, but there's a whole, whole of uh, sorting people out into different sort of uh, groups where they can help one another and uh, get help from other people. Um, in methods, I'll mention to you, um, we used to do um, a QuickBooks training for all types of businesses, and it was a oh, six or seven hour training. You know, it was like eight till noon and one to three, and everybody had a laptop before them, and the instructor's laptop was protected and they had a workbook with it and it was a very thorough training and it cost about $125 for a full day and we always have 12 to 15 people come and take that and what we came to discover from it that it was a very effective method there was so much material in there 
in QuickBooks and some people didn't have accounting fundamentals or bookkeeping fundamentals to help them do it. And so they would take this and go home and in a week they were completely lost again. And we um fortunate enough to get a, an RBA grant from UCA a few years ago that funded a program for us um, where the uh, participants came and they uh, received a new copy of QuickBooks. They had two uh, group training sessions a week apart where they went over a variety of material. And then the instructor actually went to each individual business funded the grant and spent about three hours helping that farm business set up their books, get their chart of accounts in order develop a workflow system and and uh, get the process underway of actually hands-on with somebody there. And then it provided um, uh, assistance by phone. They could call in to the instructor for, I think it was six months, something like that. And it was just an incredible program for the, the success rate that the people had, not for learning, but then for feeling like they really were in charge of their bookkeeping and understood of what needed to be done and, and how to get help when they needed it. Set up for advisors to come in later and work with them on reporting and using that information for management information and not just bookkeeping for tax returns. Um, the other method that we really find successful now is uh, um, to match clients up with private bookkeepers. And in our area, private bookkeepers charge anywhere from $25 to $60 an hour, depending on their affiliation and all. And in three or four hours, a bookkeeper can set up a system entirely and do that teaching process with somebody and also be the reference for the future for them um, to offer assistance to go on as needed. So what I... Concepts I wanted to present to you today. Um, after Nikki's presentation, we'll have time for question and answer, and I look forward to discussing any areas further with you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops, sorry, myself. Right. Thanks, Steve. Um, now we will hand it over to Nikki Siebert of Low country, local first. Um, just give me one to pull it up. Thank you, Sam. And um, thank you, Steve, for uh, laying the groundwork for this presentation. I really am excited to be here and share some information with you guys today. Um, I want to apologize for the echo. Um, hopefully, it's not too bad. I don't know, Sam, is it, is it pretty bad? I'm not hearing it at all, actually. Well, as Sam said, uh, my name is Nikki Seibert, and I am the Director of Sustainable Agriculture for Low Country Local First. Um, we are located down in Charleston, South Carolina. So um, today I'm going to be doing an overview, um, give some background, and run through some best practices learned through our project. And, um, Sam, I'm having trouble going to my next slide. I'll click on the slide and then use the right arrow key. Does that work? Oh, what? Uh, just switch to me. Here. here. <laughs> uh, there you go. Oh. Oh. Oh, I did <laughs> I think it was just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, so um, like I said, today we're going to go over some background um, and some required records, talk a little bit about production, um, planning, financial records, human resources, and then go over some resources you all can use beyond uh, this presentation today. So Nation is a nonprofit that advocates for independent businesses and farmers. We have two main initiatives that you all can see here. Um, I won't read through the entire slide, but um, the E program is the program that I oversee. And, um, you know, we're trying to address the local food system issues we're facing here um, and increase um, the success rate of our farmers in this area. So our main programs, um, new farmers, farm services, and consumer education and outreach. So um, we have uh, a feeder program, Starting New Farmers, 
that's essentially uh, an apprenticeship program with a sustainable ag certificate that feeds into uh, an incubator farm and finally uh, provides farmers with direct connections to land access, um, hopefully getting them from entry level all the way to a successful business owner. Uh, beyond that, we provide monthly meetings and trainings um, for these farmers, existing and new and beginning farmers, as well as some listserv opportunities to connect. Uh, while simultaneously making sure we educate the community on the importance of eating local, the seasonality of produce, uh, and where they can access this local food. So a lot of great things happening down here um, and pretty unique to the state. So we're currently the only incubator farm and apprenticeship program uh, in South Carolina. And we'll, we'll, here we go. Um, so our incubator farm, just to give you guys a frame of reference for our project, it's new. Uh, we were launched in the fall of 2012 through a USDA Rural Business Enterprise Grant. We currently have six participants. Uh, we are providing infrastructure, access to equipment, mentorship, marketing, and networking. These folks are paying $2,000 a year and have roughly three years to incubate their business. Um, they get an acre and a half of land, and we meet with them biweekly. And uh, we currently have uh, myself managing overall on the project. And then we brought on a full-time farm manager uh, to assist with the day-to-day -day operations. Where we a 10-acre parcel is lar of part of a larger 70-acre uh, working production uh, vegetable farm. So um, that hopefully gives you a little bit of context about our uh, market and demographic. I keep using my <laughs> regular connections here. So today, since a lot of you all are actually managing projects similar to ours, I'm going to approach this from both the project perspective as well as the farmer perspective. And um, I think it's important to always remind ourselves that the farmers are often looking to us as best examples. So oftentimes, um, I find myself giving them advice that I am not actually following. <laughs> so um, make sure that you as an organization and as a business are running in a way that provides um, a great example for these farmers. For us, um, you know, making sure that our farmers have good records helps us have good records. So, you know, making sure that they have great financials and product information, that information is coming back to us. So that allows us to better serve them as a program and as a facilitator. So we want to make sure we're capturing um, both that quantitative and that qualitative data. And I see often in projects, um, even in farm operations, there's really, it's usually all or nothing. Um, you make sure that if you're saying you have six farmers, you want to know what type of farmers they are, what are their production practices, what is their age and demographic, and why did they um, why need the project. So often that qualitative gives those numbers some meaning, um, and you, you need both of those to tell the full story. So always keeping that in mind. And, you know, for us, um, often our farmers, when talking to us, um, they think they're doing okay. And um, when we take a look at their books, we realize that they can be in trouble or they're, they're just about to be in trouble and they just don't see it coming. And so um, having, you know, keeping on top of their records and having them share those records with us allows us to help them avoid some common pitfalls of a new business owner and also lets me know if I need to connect them specifically with any kind of an expert or consultant or mentor in an area of their business. And, um, and I'll honestly, you know, them hold accountable and have to meet one-on-one -on -one often actually forces them to do their records uh, because no, uh, it's like homework, so they have to make sure that they have it. So that, that also helps, just knowing that they have to submit them to us um, often makes them more accountable. And, you know, making sure that if you're asking them to keep a certain kind of record, um, just like Steve said, there are a lot of people in the community that are willing to mentor or help with that process. So um, not just letting, not just asking them for a profit and loss statement, but um, connecting them with a bookkeeper and an accountant that can help them develop that, uh, you know, in tandem with whatever software they may be using um, or system they've got. So um, maybe you're kind of following through to connect them with those experts. And we've had a lot of luck with members in the community doing that at no charge, you know, an initial one-hour consultation for free. And then if the farmer wants to continue to work with them, they can continue to do that um, in a paid transaction. And, um, that's, you know, from a project um, record standpoint, that's always that were um, motivations for us to keep records um, on our own. So currently the way our program runs with our incubated farmers is we do quarterly check-ins. And every quarterly check-in, we want to 
see um, their production plans, um, their yields, and their profit and loss. Um, I don't do that alone. I am actually not a numbers person at all. So um, we have an on-staff bookkeeper that joins me in those meetings to try to identify any issues that we may see coming up um, and talk through cash flow and intended markets and just do some advising. Um, we also are in the process right now, um, you know, January of the year, we do uh, an annual survey and an in-depth review of their financials um, and production records from the previous year. So really talking through this intensively uh, with myself, uh, farm manager, our bookkeeper, and then if they have a farm mentor, um, bringing those people into that conversation as well. And for our folks to have um, you know, business and financial mentorship, and that's what we're finding is that we don't necessarily have the expertise in the area that are, are very familiar and comfortable with the business of fame, but they're comfortable with business memory in general. So in the score system, um, you know, there's retired executives um, and, and having it be a two-way street. Those mentors, they understand business. The farmers can kind of guide them and learn more about the challenges that are being faced by um, farm business owners. So make sure that they're not just getting production mentorship, but have that business mentorship as well. We do require annually that they um, let us have a, a copy of their Schedule F and balance sheet. Um, there's a lot of na uh, numbers and narratives on their cost of goods, their revenue, their expenses, and their yields. Um, we want to know kind of what are they producing and how much are they producing. Um, that gives us great information um, when thinking about metrics and evaluations. Uh, and grant reporting, as well as just understanding and getting a firm grasp on what can be done in this area. Um, for us, there are not a lot of farmers that are producing small intensive. So when people ask us for numbers, um, that's where we're going to be able to get this information is from our actual uh, program participants. So thinking about how we communicate, as Steve said, you know, with these farmers and the as business owners, how do we motivate them? And, you know, for us, a lot of our conversation stems from uh, understanding through apprenticeship and into the incubator farm, you know, do you be a business owner or do you want to work on a farm? And separating those two. Um, do you want to do this as a profession or do you want to do this as a hobby? Um, and where are your strengths? Are, are your strengths 100% in production? You know, do you have some business strengths? And determining what roles you need to play um, in your operation and bringing in experts um, or consultants or contractors where you don't think you're going to achieve these, these things. Um, so if you approach farming as a business, record essential, um, especially when you're going to be bringing in uh, potential contractors or consultants, you need a language that everybody understands. Having financial and production records that are in um, a, you know, a, a un cross sector language is really going to help these people communicate well. Um, like I said, if you're asking for a loan, um, they're going to be looking for very specific numbers. They're not really interested in what varieties of vegetables you're growing or how awesome the farm market went. Um, you know, there's a language that they're using, and, and it's giving and teaching them this language so that they can communicate uh, with other business mentors and advisors. So um, when we talk with our farmers, you know, always push them to think about how they could be answering. Um, the questions that they have for me if they kept better records. They're asking me what markets they should get into or whether or not they should produce a certain crop, and I'm constantly referring them back to um, their records and letting them know that that's a window into their business. And there's so little control over so many components of agriculture, and I always try to appeal to their, their desire for control. Um, so knowing um, what may and what didn't, what markets were lucrative and which ones weren't, uh, how much cash flow you have and when, when you need to ask for money, uh, so you can see it coming, so it's not, you're not getting blindsided. And obviously, compliance, you know, make sure that you're meeting your business requirements and um, as men and, you know, able to file taxes and not have to worry about penalties and feel confident that you can actually ask for money and know based on your projections and your previous year's experience and records that you can, you'll be able to pay them back. So it's providing you the tools to make sound business decisions and, and not have to have that, that the stress um, and that concern over is this the right decision, yes or no. Um, 
you know, you're already going to be faced with deciding which markets, when to plant, and what to plant. Why not have um, some basic information that helps steer um, what has and hasn't worked based on, you know, this may form decisions. So I try to appeal to folks by recognizing that there are a lot of tools out there that use the overlap. So finding ways to have your uh, financials and your crop planning documents overlap in a consistent way so you're not having to re-enter that data over and over again. Uh, so making sure they realize that they're, that's a potential opportunity for them um, to ease that, the burden of that process. Without um, the different components and breaking it out, I like to think about it as produ production records, financial records, and then human resource records. On farming, there's a lot of focus on production. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of fun tools out there now for production, record keeping, uh, crop planning, um, projecting your financials based on yields, um, determining what markets work for you. So a lot of these tools are really going to vary based on the intended market outlet, um, where you are and what you're growing, and what the pricing structures are going to be. Uh, you know, the southeast, our climate's a lot different. There's some year-round growing, and there's different viability in different markets. So it's you can't necessarily use all these tools um, all over the country. Sometimes you have to look for climate-specific tools because the numbers you'll find in how much you can sell per pound. Uh, a certain variety of product is going to be very skewed based on the region um, and even within that state or in that city. So um, this comes down to, for us, a lot of times we re refer people to enterprise budgets, which if you're not familiar with an enterprise budget, I'm going to show you one. Really kind of capturing the numbers of what are the true costs of production. So making sure that, that, these, that these farmers are carrying all their costs and expenses and all their sources of revenue revenue accurately um, for their area and for their individual business and refining that year after year so they get closer and closer to having the most accurate numbers possible. So we are, there, the last bullet is really referring to that, the qualitative. So this is where farmers are often the strongest. They kind of know what didn't work last year. They can remember in their mind what field they planted it in, um, but often um, it gets a little bit muddy over the years. So make sure that they're taking those field notes down, field, on a binder, handwritten notes, um, in a spreadsheet, whatever appeals to them. There's even mobile apps they can use um, that are capturing what's happening in the field and, and painting an accurate picture that can be paired with those numbers uh, and with those production records so that they understand. Okay, it, it looks like um, I'm on onions, but man, it's brutal, and we really just, it was not, I did not enjoy doing that at all. Making sure that they can uh, flesh out the details that may not be captured by those hard production um, records. I'll show a few examples, and I'm going to go through the details of each of these spreadsheets, because um, there are, just with this one resource, which you can see the link at the bottom, um, just with this, they had, I think, like, like 14 spreadsheets that you can use. So there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. It's more about finding which and layouts and software resonate with your farmers. So I walk farmers through these different spreadsheets, and then you know, and then we have advisors work with them one on one to adapt what works best for them and their work style. So what you're seeing here is is using information both from um, the bad, their seed packets and their experience and their you know, season and figuring out what the timing of their crops are going to be. Um, and then thinking about when am I going to have to harvest this based on when I seed it. So that you can get a calendar for yourself, if you, especially if you're doing relay planting. Um, being able to know what's coming when and that helps you know about your cash flow and that helps you know when you're going to need labor and that helps you know uh, which markets you sell to and what you'll be ready for when. So kind of guiding um, those decision-making. You're not just planting it all at once because you have the time. <laughs> it's like really thinking about how is this going to impact my business beyond the planting. And another one here, again, direct seeding. It's the harvest weeks. These are preset. So, you know, you're putting these data, and it's already got all of the um, calculations are plugged in um, based on weeks and, um, and different, you know, modules of variety. So, Again, this spreadsheet, all these 
spreadsheets are available um, at no cost online um, at this NC State uh, resource, and it can be adapted as necessary. And um, you know, recognizing the limitations based on location. This is information that was developed um, in Goldsboro, North Carolina. So if you're in that climate zone, you need to just reality check yourself on that and make sure you're not, um, you know, misusing this data, especially for folks that are still really new to production um, and knowing that there's going to be some variation based on your climate, your soil type, um, and, you know, your specific production practices. And, um, you know, this is, I wanted to refer to these enterprise budgets. So this is put out through the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, and they service North and South Carolina. This is a great tool for folks. Um, there are other ones that have been put out um, nationally. This was done focused on organic production, and they're looking at one acre to ten acre um, pretty. So small, but definitely pretty heavy um, mechanized production. What they're going to do here is capture the true costs of production. And give a starting point and then allowing you to input what um, influences your farm and how it differs on your farm. So it can help you calculate um, based on market rates and your existing production and your um, planned yields, how much it's going to cost and how much you could profit um, from this crop. So it's important to, to recognize the challenges in this. Um, a lot of the farmers I work with are not planting one acre of one crop. They're planting one acre of 20 crops. This could get really tedious to try and break this down by crop, but I think this is something that needs to get done um, in introducing a new crop, at least by variety. You know, if you're doing greens or a new kind of, um, uh, you know, different vegetables, thinking about it like that, you know, grouping them by category, root crops, et cetera, um, and then just altering the price you get per unit um, and using this as a kind of a, a baseline information. So again, another tool for capturing the true cost of your production and the opportunity for profit here. So these are free resources all linked at the bottom of the website. So uh, moving beyond production, the records is a challenge for both organizations and for farmers especially when working with um, existing professionals that are not familiar with agriculture. So understanding where certain costs go uh, within a budget, um, within a profit and loss, um, understanding uh, how this relates to farming. So the thing that I think a lot of people struggle with because it's very intimidating, and this is an area in which we have very heavily relied on experts. So folks working one-on-one -on -one with our farmers to help them get to a point where they're comfortable with their numbers and their budgets. Um, the big challenge for a lot of folks is the first time they ever have to do it because they don't necessarily know what their numbers are, and they're guessing on a lot of their, their volume, their yields, um, and their profits. So um, it's to communicate to them that you have to start somewhere, and that's your jumping off place. And as I mentioned earlier, every year you're going to be trying to, you know, Fine to, you know, go through this with a fine tooth comb and refine it and get it closer and closer to accurate. So you're, trying, you're, you're currently evolving um, and becoming more efficient, and these should reflect more accurately your business from year to year. So these are just some um, what I think of as kind of essential financial records, um, you know, projected budget, making sure you're recording your expenses and your income. And don't necessarily have to do this every day or even every week. Some people consolidate this at the end of their month. Um, you know, your balance sheets and um, understanding assets and liabilities, um, profit and loss or income statements, which, you know, reflecting all of your revenues, expenses, adjustments, and taxes. And then keeping that in mind that, like earlier, not duplicating, a lot of this information can be put through um, into your Schedule F. So if you're developing um, record-keeping systems, go ahead and create the same categories that you're going to have to have for your Schedule F. Um, the, this page, you'll see a document that I've referred to that helps define a lot of terms, financial terms. Um, it is a plethora of information. There's almost too many terms, but if you ever have questions about financial terms, that's a great um, resource to refer people to. So, um, is when we're down to brass tax, um, 
the documents we're thinking about that they need to be thinking about uh, creating and working with a professional to create. And then moving from there, this is logistically, they need to sure that they're keeping their receipts, their invoices, um, having their credit card statements all in one place, make sure they keep copies of checks. And understanding that it goes beyond just having those, they need to have information um, that extends beyond hard copies. Um, keeping notes of who paid and who paid on time and um, any additional costs or repairs, things that may not seem like direct cost to your business. And um, I, I felt like it was important to note that a lot of a, a struggle comes with a lot of our participants because they have a hard time understanding what's a personal cost versus a business cost. And there seems to be a lot of overlap. And I've had folks bring in budgets and they've got stuff in their budget that's for their own personal finances. So they need to have a totally separate budget for themselves. That, that is going to basically create one or two line items in their business budget. Um, so understand that it's, it, there's clear um, difference between the two because we don't want them having their business finances, putting their personal finances in jeopardy um, or them getting trouble um, from a tax perspective because they're not keeping those separate. And um, the bottom bullet is referencing what I mentioned earlier, that understanding that, that it's more than just table dollars, but their business records need to reflect um, all of their assets and any depreciation. And you're going to find that on a receipt. So it's kind of making sure they understand the big picture and all the different columns that go into those financial documents. So this is um, a, uh, just a screenshot of the categories that go into a Schedule F. So they've got an Excel spreadsheet or they're using a software. You know, these are the things that are, they're going to be asked on their Schedule F. So trying to um, kind of organize their, themselves with these in mind will make the system a lot easier. And if they're working with an accountant, this is what the accountant is going to be referring to. So understanding which categories are which and what goes under which category. And that often can be dynamic. So there's often a choice on where you put things. Working with your accountant and in that relationship so they can have a good conversation with you that's realistic and based on your operation. And the last piece um, I want to touch on is the human resource component. And what I see so often um, from a lot of our businesses is that they don't know how to pay themselves or when to pay themselves or budget for their own pay. And um, I, I always have to really emphasize that this is an essential component to creating a realistic business because oftentimes um, new business owners don't quote unquote pay themselves, um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be budgeting as if you're going to pay yourself and pricing as if you're going to pay yourself. So making sure they understand that they need to create budgets that are, are based on the true cost of production, which includes their time. And the idea is that you want to be aiming for a business where eventually you can pay yourself, but that if, the, if you can't, uh, if you're having trouble balancing out, that maybe you don't pay yourself, but that it was in the budget. You just couldn't meet that um, requirement. And when you're looking for loans and lending, if they don't see that you're paying yourself, that's going to be a huge red flag. Uh, so just making sure that that's a, a piece of that, um, of that, of your business plan and these reporting documents. And also, I see a lot of times folks have volunteer help. Um, they maybe have family members helping them. They have a crop mob. Um, these don't necessarily need to go in your formal books, but you need to be noting somewhere that you did have assistance and how many hours that was. So that, again, you can accurately price in the future because next year you may not have that same help. And, and you need to know, if I need to hire someone, how many hours would I potentially need someone to help me achieve the same uh, volume I had last year. So always just keeping track of, of what's happening on the ground and um, giving yourself a reminder and having a kind of a touchstone for planning the next year um, so you can accurately reflect what happened and, um, and kind of see where you may need some assistance in the following year. And on the human resource side, understanding full-time versus part-time, keeping good records, um, you know, um, um, you know, providing them with um, information on best practices on the farm, you know, you're having, keeping log their hours, um, having a system in place so that if you have folks on the farm that it's very clear, um, you know, processes for 
for payments and for hours and are there benefits and nights and weekend policies and reliability coverage, um, you know, do you have workman's comp? You know, just making sure that all those those components of the record are very clear. What happens if someone get injured, gets injured? What is that process? Are you creating a log for that? Um, you know, what kind of record keeping are you doing for your farmers or for your employees? You know, are you recording how often you train them and when? Um, there are all things that you need to think about as a human resource component if you do have an employee that's not happy or an apprentice that's not happy. Um, you need to be able to show how you're managing them as, you know, as a business owner. And then, you know, not going into the contract worker um, black hole, being very careful. Uh, there are some laws around contract work um, and agriculture. So, um, you know, keeping a mindful eye that there's a lot of crackdowns and how people utilize some of the loopholes in contract workers essentially pay someone less money. Um, that's not always what the intent is out the gate. Um, but that's how it often is perceived um, from a tax perspective. So just really understanding labor laws and so you're managing um, and keeping records so that ever did get audited or if there ever was a lawsuit, um, you have, if, it, if you write it down, it didn't happen. So make sure you have, something, you have this information written down. So um, you know, thinking about going beyond this, I, uh, you guys are here through NIFTY, but NIFTY has some great sources. Um, you're keeping some sample files. They also have that great metrics and evaluation tool, which I think really falls in line parallel with record keeping. So, you know, we have these records, but if we don't ever look at them, and if we don't ever pull the data and view them, then um, we haven't really understood the full value. So make sure we're looking back at our records, looking at trends, um, and then using those as tools for evaluation and creating metrics. You know, based on our farm, how many acres of produce was created off last year? Um, you know, what are the biggest challenges that they're facing um, financially? What are the biggest ch uh, challenges they're facing from production? And how is our program going to address that? So it helps us justify our programming and our training because we've, not, we've had these records and then now we've evaluated them and we've created some metrics around that. So utilizing the tools through NIFTY to kind of create that, the holistic picture um, at your program and also helping those farmers have a holistic experience in the program and, and make sure we make those connections. So there are um, either all these software tools out there. A lot of folks are very um, excited when they first learn about them and then they see the cost and they're very turned off. But um, I think if people are truly recording the time it takes for them, um, to go back through their information at the end of the year that they haven't been documenting correctly, would happily pay money to go back, you know, back to the <laughs> back tense and uh, and really have input some of this information and have a tool that can consolidate and create and just spit out reports for you. So um, Ag Squared is a software that's very popular that that kind of fuses. Um, some of the financial and production and management and human resource tools all together. And um, I think when paired with QuickBooks, those two can create a really robust financial and production um, record-keeping tool farmers. The key with, with Ag Squared, with QuickBooks, with any tool that you use is that if you don't put the information in there, it's not going to self gate And I think that's often a trap. People are like, it didn't do anything for me. You know, they promised all these fancy things, but nothing happened. Um, if you're not inputting the data, then there's not any content for it to evaluate. So um, there's a lot of resources out there. There's videos. Um, there's training tools for QuickBooks, for Ag Squared. Um, but I'm always trying to encourage folks to recognize that we focus so much on, you know, how much it's going to cost to repair the tractor, how much we're going to invest in seeds, and we're not thinking about how much money we should be investing to the business component of our farm operation. So making sure to encourage them that parallel for every production expense, they probably should be making a business expense so they just can grow parallel so that we're not getting so good at production, but we can't figure out why we're not succeeding as a business and, um, and, and helping them recognize how to self-evaluate and the tools to help you self-evaluate when you need to make change, how do you make that change, where do you make that change, and do you need money, assistance, or mentorship to make that happen. So, um, 
you know, these are all the resources that uh, were used for this presentation. I strongly encourage you guys to check them out on your own time and determine what works best for your farmers. You know, the best uh, tool that exists out there is Google. So there are plenty of things you can Google specific for farmers and, um, you know, talking with your extension agents, talking with your small de um, business development centers, and looking into the community for those professionals that can work one-on-one -one and provide and steward um, your program participants and also your own program so that you can make sure you're doing the best practices that are out there um, and, you know, being willing to bring in those experts for folks when you can't meet their needs. Um, this is our website. Um, that's my contact information. Feel free to get in touch with me if you guys have any questions um, beyond this webinar. And um, that is all for me. So thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Um, so I hope uh, that everyone else is getting uh, your questions ready. Um, and just a reminder, you can be entering those into the uh, chat box um, over to the right-hand side. You can be entering them into the, into the chat box at any time now so that we can sort of start going over them um, as, as we get to the Q&A part. So we, in the meantime, I'll just quickly go over a few next steps. Um, we have quite a bit of free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and uh, mentoring available to offer startup projects uh, through project partners, uh, who include some of the longest running incubator projects in the U.S. So interested in that, um, please touch with us, either Brianna or myself. Um, our contact info will come up on the last slide, and it'll also be a follow-up email. And we will have more webinars coming up, including um, more advanced topics in land access and other topics related to transitioning farmers uh, off the incubator sites. Uh, again, there are a lot, lot of free resources uh, available on the web website. Um, so, uh, now we're ready to take questions for uh, for the presenters. I'm not seeing much of the questions in the box. Um, in the, so if you have questions, please send them over. Um, I do, uh, if, if you click send to everyone, or else you could select me individually. Um, else we're not going to see them. So if you're trying to get them directly to the presenters, it, it might work so well. Um, but in the meantime, I had a couple of things. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, if you have... Any examples of farmers um, who have specific examples of farmers who benefited from, from record keeping practices? Um, you know, in, in what Steve was calling the, the gain category, rather than just you know avoiding tax problems, that sort of thing. Um, do you have any specific examples? Sure, one of a, a farm that I worked with some years ago with a, another colleague over in the Connecticut River Valley that was a, a veggie production farm. And one of his favorite crops was growing beans. Beans did very well on his property, and his customers loved his beans. And so when we went in and did enterprise analysis to see what his beans were costing him um, grow, we found out that he was if losing money on growing beans for the past few years he'd been growing more and more because they were so popular and that was just a simple example of uh, using his numbers and his records to be able to uh, consider which enterprises are correct for him um, as, as far as thinking about um, records holistically we went through a walkthrough of one of our farmers, and um, he felt like one of his crops was making a whole lot of money, but um, towards the end of the year, it started losing money. And we were able to go through on his handwritten notes, read through that time of year. The reason why he was losing money was because he was having a major disease outbreak, and um, and that's why he was having a loss is because his cost to manage the disease was so great. And he was able to address that in the second year by doing um, a break in the planting and planting again on a separate section of his property. So, you know, thinking about what's, you know, it goes beyond 
just serves. And by having that reading as to why did he start losing money on this? You know, why was it taking so long for him to harvest and pack at the end of the year? It's because he's having to be um, so much more uh, picky about you know, storage greens by hand and you know, having to pay an extra person and just having those notes to self um, that it was taking a lot of time um, the loan helped him kind of address that issue and, and continue to make money on it the next year. I had one other thought too and uh, when Nikki talked about creating budgets and cash flow projections um, to plan your year and set your targets uh, for how your business is going to do. Your record-keeping system is used during the course of the year to see where you are at any one time and allows you to compare actual to budget. And so anytime you can see whether or not you're on pace with your plan, what this allows you to do then is that if you are um, not performing up to your plan, you can catch that earlier and make adjustments. And then to be overperforming, if you're doing even better than you think, you may be able to take advantage of opportunities that you didn't know were available to you. Um, we have a question in the comments. Uh, uh, any overarching data points that uh, the incubator farms should be monitoring and sharing with the participants, whether soils, et cetera? to have not really been able to do this um, extensively because we didn't have a full-time farm manager. And I think that's probably the most relevant person to be able to provide that feedback and information. Uh, the program has relied most heavily on the adjacent farmer, who's really a mentor um, for those farm businesses. So I'd say the biggest balance that we strike with this kind of information is at what point do we need to help connect them with the right resources so they can find it on the program? And at what point do we want to make sure we're providing them with pertinent information? So it's, I really, I would have joked that I feel like a parent. Like I, I want to tell them everything. Like, you know, don't sell this market or, you know, it's going to get to this temperature. Make sure you do X, Y, and Z. I want to strike a balance of making to create an environment where they have the resources at their fingertips but that they have to, to be act, take action um, and take, you know, the, and be incentivized to um, do it on their own. So um, I think, you know, once we have a consistent person site, that person can give their updates and talk about past soil experiences. Um, I think it's most important for us as we think on our current participants and think about our graduates that we make sure we have a system for relaying that information from participant to participant. Because we had one one that had already transitioned off, and they kind of did a handoff. You know, here's our experienced drainage problems. The soil has done better for melons. Um, you know, I've always had a problem with wind over on this side. And um, we really should create some kind of a system for making sure we capture that information from year to year. But we don't have anything to date. The question here that that's specifically for Nikki. Um, it's, uh, did you say that you meet with the farmers in your program on a bi-weekly basis? So do you use all three records, production, financial, and human resources uh, at the agenda for these meetings? Kill me if, <laughs> if that was the agenda. Um, I meet with them bi-weekly as a, a check-in and more of an on-the-ground, um, you know, what's going on, what are the needs, um, not playing nice. <laughs> um, you know, what daily interactions do they need? But I use those three records on a quarterly basis. So um, I find that those records are really, really intimidating for folks, and people are at a different pace. And really, is just about as, as often as we could get people to meet with us and talk about it. So the biweekly meetings, um, we do a one-on-one -on -one personal check-in. How are you doing personally? And how is your farm doing? And let us know what are you growing and how's it how's it going? And um, then we talk through any infrastructure issues, any challenges, any upcoming trainings. Um, and then folks kind of talk about advice or ideas, and we have one main topic of discussion um, that they vote on as far as what they want resources or information about. So we're only using those quarterly. Okay. Um. Uh, should, uh, this would be for either of you. Um, do you have advice 
for a situation where farmers um, or or a project gets um, behind on record keeping, um, in matching up or or dealing with missing debt, that seems that's one of the kinds of areas where um, we just did the whole thing because you get too far behind. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, we're actually currently experiencing this because we're asking for end of year reports for folks. And um, the previous year, we did ask for that information. Uh, we didn't have a, a bookkeeper to work with. And so people handed in information to me. And in my inexperience, I was like, oh, this looks great. Um, and they were actually missing significant chunks of information. So uh, we're asking people to, when necessary, estimate. But we always mark that 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 is an estimate because they make it really clear that these are not, this is not solid uh, on the ground information. Um, but I don't think it ever is going to hurt uh, to have an incomplete data set because it's better than nothing. So I think estimates are okay. And that's experiencing this year. We've never before asked them for a volume, uh, production volume by crop. So they haven't been tracking that throughout the year. So they're going to have to go back and do estimates. So the, the looking backwards, they're going to have to do all estimates. Estimates. Moving forward, like before, every year your records are going to get better and better because you're going to get more comfortable with them and you're going to get closer and closer to your actual numbers. So that's a natural process anyways, even if you were recording everything. Um, it's still going to get better and better every year. So I think it's as long as you're marking where the estimates are, I don't think that's a problem. Um, as far as tax purposes, what they're actually looking for is, is, is so much, it's very specific. And you can use your bank receipts and your um, copies of checks and your invoices, and you can consolidate that and not worry about. You're probably not have some accurate cash flow recorded, um, but that's for you know for your own business to know. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to that that um, it would kind of make me think we might ought to work a little on the system with them and. It if the system's not workable for them and not meeting their needs, to think about revising that. Um, okay. Um, unless anyone else has a question, I, I guess I have one last question. Um, so I, I work with, here at New Enter, I work with a number of beginning sheep farmers, and uh, I've grown up on sheep farm, it drives me nuts how few sheep farmers how few of the sheep farmers are keeping greeting records. And that's a thing that personally drives me nuts because I that's something I grew up with. So I wonder if there's anything that either of you consistently see not being tracked, which which just is a heave or you just you just like, why can't more people, why don't more people do this? I would, see, I would say that uh, a lot of our farmers are not tracking um, – we don't sell. I know this sounds crazy, but um, I'm, I'm very interested in what comes back from the market and never and never sells. So it's like this total mystery um, as to what have they lost. So we know what's coming out of the field and we know how much money they made, but often those numbers aren't reflecting what was lost. And you, know, you can use those, that information to work backwards, you know, what, you, what your yields were and what you made. You can estimate, um, but that's not, not tracking um, how much product is being wasted, which um, that's an important part of your business and understanding why that's happening. Um, but just uh, as far as records, I just want to make a little note that I encourage people to use whatever works for them. And that one of the tools that you have in this stage is a camera phone. So um, taking pictures of something and texting it to yourself with a note, take a picture of a disease, um, and emailing it to yourself because that's going to date and time stamp it. Um, taking a picture of the two critters, um, you know, what their offspring look like and, and writing a note to yourself and um, you know, using those those tools on your phone um, as a resource. It doesn't have to be a spreadsheet. Like I personally am not a spreadsheet person. I email myself reminders all the time. Um, and and utilize, making sure you're using that technology. Um, and if, if that's not your style, then having a composition notebook or skin notebook and just writing it down somewhere. Um, you may not put it later, but um, I actually have a farmer that pays a girl, a, I mean, in vegetables, and he hands her the 
notebook and she types up all of his information and she puts it in a spreadsheet with dates. So, you know, really thinking creatively about how do you get that information to paper. Now, we have another question here. It's kind of a big question, but if you guys have any thoughts. Um, after tracking the data, are your farmers able to meet land and equipment rental, uh, allowing them to make a profit on one and a half acres? Or maybe whatever um, acres you would be working with. financials for 2014 um, right now. So by February 1st, we should know um, how these guys are doing financially um, verbally because <laughs> that's, you know, I do check in with them to see how they're doing. Um, of our farm um, operations right now, um, two of them are solely farmers. That's their only source of income. And um, they're all able to meet their personal expenses while still expending their business expenses. That's not a true reflection of how their business is doing. Uh, they are clearly surviving off of it. I wouldn't necessarily call that a living. Um, but uh, one of our farmers has been very open and honest about the fact that he's trying to maximize the low overhead. Um, right now, he's spending a lot of money on marketing and product placement and product development. So if you were to look at his financials, it doesn't look like he's making any money, but that's because he's investing a lot of money into the overall growth of his business while he has low overhead at our farm. So his projections show him um, making uh, roughly $30,000 a year to be able to pay himself by year five uh, of his uh, operating his business, which to me, um, I can feel good about making that on an acre and a half. Um, but it just depends on... Uh, partially perception. You know, is it, is it does it work for them or not? Do they are they confident as a business owner? Can they justify, um, you know, all of that work for that amount of income? So I'll let you bring it first. <laughs> I don't do enough work in an incubator setting to be able to run to that, so I can't help with that that one. Um, more question. Uh, do you have uh, average revenue figures handy for your, your farmers? Let me answer that just then. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Good yes or no question that everyone would would be able to say <laughs> yes, but I don't know how many of us can. That's why we have these webinars. Ask us again next year. And well, it looks like that's it for the questions, and we're right on time, too. Um, so everyone uh, for attending, Please remember to fill out uh, the evaluations. Uh, here's uh, some of our contact info, and that will also be in the email for everyone who registered. Uh, so thanks very much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.